How do senior living communities and the attitudes about them among residents and staffs hold up during the coronavirus pandemic? To gauge the health crisis's impact, the architecture firm Perkins Eastman surveyed 200 industry professionals and interviewed more than 80 industry leaders. Perkins Eastman presented its findings during a recent webinar that also shared the sentiments about independent living and safety of 5,000 senior living residents who responded to a poll last summer by the development advisor, Plant Moran Living Forward. Joining us today to discuss their research and where senior living might be headed are Alexis Denton, Associate Principal with Perkins Eastman, and Dana Walschlager, Practice Leader and Partner with Plant Moran Living Forward. Alexis, Dana, welcome. Thank you. Alexis, let's start with you and, and uh, your firm's survey, which portrays a resilient senior living sector. But to talk a little bit about what, how the impact of the, that the pandemic might have on future design and resident expectations. Yeah, thanks, John. I, I, I think that the main thing that we're hearing is that a lot of the, the short-term changes in design that we've seen in the last 15 months are actually going to be um, long-term changes um, in, re in response both to pandemic and, and to changing consumer expectations. Um, first, there is a, a greater focus on outdoor environments and transitional spaces, those spaces between indoor and outdoor environments, and, and not just because of ventilation requirements um, around safety and, and transmission of the virus, but more for how those spaces impact um, resident and staff wellness. I think a lot of us have found solace in the outdoor environment during this time, and, and we think that that will continue. So we see a greater emphasis on outdoor rooms that are extension of interior amenity spaces that could even be climate controlled. Um, and then, you know, culinary programs, it's another area where so, so many of us have found, um, found a, a place of happiness during the pandemic is what we're eating. Um, so we, we think that there will be some changes coming out of that in senior living. So we're expecting to see um, more flexible culinary offerings from takeout to smaller group settings, just a more variety of, of types and sizes of spaces. Um, and then we'll see, we think a greater flexibility in amenity spaces. So we may move towards more decentralized spaces that are smaller scale and you know, are, are, are separated throughout the multiple buildings. Um, instead of these all these centralized spaces together. Um, and finally, you know, this notion of, of group living or living within a pod. Um, so the small house model, which, which I can get to a little bit more later, is really about this notion of living within a family, living within a pod in a very residential environment. And, and we think that some of those ideas may trickle down to other types of care, may, may work in assisted living and even independent living. So really the themes of community and flexibility, um, which we, we know are gonna continue, but those are really what have made, um, in our opinion, the, the senior living sector resilient. Mm -hmm. The survey also found some conflicting impressions about life plan communities. How did your firm read that data? Yeah, we, we, we asked a couple of questions about um, the outlook on the, the model. And what we heard was that fewer respondents than in previous years thought that the model was endangered. But when we asked about how attractive the model was, um, more respondents thought that it was less attractive than in, in previous years. So we kind of got you know, some, some differing opinions on the outlook for that model. Um, we think the decline in attractiveness may be due to uh, declining interest in the entry fee model and um, you know, more preference for rental and a la carte services. Um, but that, you know, this, this positive outlook on the model long-term really reflects again, that resilience of, the, of the, the industry and that those core tenants of the life plan community remain strong. And those core tenants being, you know, providing community, providing social connections, um, providing a, a lifestyle in these communities. Um, those, those, you know, are, are, are really, um, those will, will remain strong and those are why people move into these communities. So we think that that is really why there is still a positive outlook for the model moving forward. The, the research also saw, uncovered some shifts in preferences about non-traditional living models in favor of apartments for life, uh, hybrid independence slash assisted living and in wellness centers as well. Um, 
you know, how are those like those preferences likely to manifest themselves in, in communities going forward? Yeah, we saw um, less interest, interest in urban living and multi-generation living and, and destination living abroad, but increased interest in um, models that offer, offer flexibility mm-hmm. in how and where care is accessed. So you mentioned you know, apartments for life, hybrid, independent mm-hmm. assisted living, and centers for healthy living. So, so those are all about flexibility in, in, again, how care is accessed so that people have the choice um, for, for, for where they want to live and, and, and not moving. So again, that theme of flexibility um, carries through. So we think we're going to see more of those models and we're preparing for that. We, we think that we may even see some existing life plan communities want to modify their buildings to incorporate those models. Certainly centers for healthy living, which are really wellness centers on steroids. Um, and, and we think we may see some adjustments to independent assisted living. So again, that, that notion of um, the, the smaller scale living, the potting, um, so that some higher levels of care can be brought into independent living um, when people need it so they're not moving. Mm-hmm. Um, your, respond, your respondent said that seniors overwhelmingly want to be part of a community. And um, I'd like you to, you mentioned small house models and so forth. Talk a little bit about the kind of tailored long, long-term long care, small house models, some of the ideas that would bring more seniors into these types of communities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the small house model of skilled nursing, it's, it's been around probably for uh, 15 years now. It was really uh, spearheaded by the greenhouse movement um, and they're still, still very active um, it's, it's a model that is, um, again, that, that family approach, that real residential approach to care. People live in smaller group settings of um, seven to 12, maybe even up to 14 residents. Care is tailored around their natural rhythm. So they can choose when they want to eat breakfast. They can choose when they want to get up. They're not, you know, they're on their own schedule. They're not on a schedule dictated by the caregivers. Um, the programming is, is, is tailored to their interests. Um, there's a family kitchen. It's, it's really, it, this is not a home-like setting. This is a true home and it's, it's designed like that and it's, it functions like that. Um, so so the, the daily rhythms are all about um, being home. So people, um, you know, they live in these group settings. They, it's, it's, it's a real family approach um, it, that creates those social connections because the caregivers are um, only working with a small group of elders they really get to know them better. They're more attuned to their needs. And again, it just creates those connections between the residents themselves and between the caregivers and, and the residents. So that social engagement is, is stronger than in more institutional models of skilled nursing. Mm-hmm. Um, just briefly, uh, you know, concerning affordability, there was some discussion during the webinar about uh, a la carte becoming a, a more, more, more prevalent model. Do you anticipate that? We do certainly, we're seeing it already in, in independent and assisted living. Yeah, and, and we expect that to continue and, and to increase um, really because of the financial constraints that um, out in the industry. Um, and yes, we, we, we certainly see that as an increasing model. Okay. John, if, if, could I just provide one little caveat to that? Please. What I, what, yeah, what I would say is that Um, That really is the preferred um, approach that most older adults would like to take. Um, However, sometimes um, from state to state to state, the regulatory environment doesn't allow it. And so so, some states require, if you're a licensed assisted living building, here's what you have to provide, whether the resident needs it or doesn't. Um, And and that can cause, you know, some real challenges. I mean, I I had a state survey once where the state came in and they're like, hey, this lady's only taking two meals a day. You're supposed to provide three. And I said, well, we do provide three. She only wants two. And she was standing in the room with me and she's like, yeah, I've never eaten breakfast in my life. I'm 89 years old. You're not telling me I'm going to eat breakfast. And by the way, I'm not paying for it. So, you know, I'm hopeful that as the baby boomers come into um, our our territory and space and start um, living in our communities, that they have a stronger voice to advocate for a more person-centered or consumer-centered uh, approach to 
what they need versus what the industry thinks they need. So mm -hmm. I, I just want to make sure that there, we identify that distinction from a licensed environment. Oh, thank you very much for doing that. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Plant Moran's uh, COVID-19 sentiment study, which found residents, prospects, and staff mostly positive yeah. about senior living and how their communities handled the health crisis. But you also noted in your comments during the webinar that uh, more than half of the assets in the top 140 MSAs are 20 years or older, which mm -hmm. presents all kinds of opportunities for upgrades, for improvements. And, you know, what do you think the community's priorities should be in that regard? Yeah, that, that's a great question, John. So in our opinion, there really are five areas of focus for providers. Um, first is leadership and governance. Um, and, and that goes for both the for-profits and the not-for-profits. The second is asset repositioning. The third would be technology. Um, fourth is making sure that financially they are a viable organization. And then lastly, we think there's some pretty um, great opportunities for strategic growth. What I would say, um, I, I think two of the most important ones based on the feedback that we received through our survey process is really asset repositioning and technology. So, you know, a lot of the organizations um, that, that are across the country you know, really have been kind of putting off um, reinvesting in their organizations and their assets. I, mm. I, once had a, I once had a board member and part of it might be financial, right? Maybe, maybe right. they can't do it. But, you know, I once had a board member say to me, we're, hey, Dana, you know what? We're one year away from paying off our debt. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's amazing. You know, when did you last take out debt? He said, 28 years ago. And I said, holy <laughs> cow, that's amazing. So you've been, you've been doing all of your capital improvements and investments back into the organization through cash. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no, we've been focused on paying off our debt. <laughs> and in my head, I'm like, yeah, and I can tell, you know, I mean, you you would not, even as a homeowner, right, you would not focus entirely on paying off your debt while your fence is falling down or paying off your debt while your plumbing is falling apart, right? Yeah. I mean, you need to reinvest in the assets that you're operating. And, and it is especially important because of the competitive environment that we're in. Um, and so there's been a lot of organizations that have been putting that off and they really need to focus on a capital improvement plan um, for their organization, um, short-term and long-term. Um, tied very closely to that is um, the need for providers to focus on um, a digital transformation. That is what I will um, call it. So, you know, there were a lot of organizations that were taking a pretty agile approach to a digital enhancement, but but the crisis probably exposed some deficiencies and forced organizations to move a little bit faster to stabilize high-speed internet or virtual programming or telehealth. It really um, showed us those organizations that were focused on technology and those that had like none, right? Because overnight, everybody had to go online and Zoom and needed high-speed internet. Um, and so that piece of it is going to be really important. Let me just sort of break that down. Um, number one, I think infrastructure is absolutely critical, mm. um, which can be challenging um, and more expensive for those assets or properties that are older, right? Um, and especially if they're, you know, steel and concrete. I mean, it, it can make things really, really difficult. I would also say that any technology um, that is going to be used um, either by families, residents, or staff um, needs to be technology that enhances the resident experience, um, improving resident outcomes, improving the staff experience, um, so that it allows us um, or or the, the fourth one I would say is, is enhancing your marketing and sales experience. Right. You know, so all of the infrastructure and technology um, is pretty expensive. So any improvements in this area really need to be evaluated in the context of will this create a return on our investment? So for example, we're evaluating smart flooring um, for uh, one of our clients. Um, and this smart flooring has the ability to track where residents are through GPS, oh. track 
tracking. It has the ability to identify um, if residents have changes in gait, which is really important to us. Why? Because that might um, mean that they're struggling and could you know, have a fall. Um, it can uh, tell us if they did have a fall um, and what and whether they're laying on the floor. So that technology, in my opinion, is fantastic because it's going to help our staff um, identify issues before they come a crisis. So if Mrs. Smith is having um, a change in her gait, let's find out why. It, the, the system is going to tell us that proactively, and we will get her the help that she needs to identify what changed in her health condition. That's going to save us on staffing. If if we have um, a, a resident care plan that says, you know, Mrs. Smith needs to be checked on every two hours, that system's going to tell us if she's moving around, right? So that we don't always have to disrupt her. So, you know, making sure that you're evaluating your technology in the context of that return on investment is really important. And then the last thing I would say about technology is don't embrace technology for technology's sake or because everybody else in the market is doing that. It is very yeah. expensive. And if you don't have a culture from the top down and the bottom up that you're actually going to use the technology in the fullest extent possible, it probably is not going to generate the return on the investment. And the example I would use is our cell phones, right? I mean, there are there's a bazillion things that our <laughs> cell phones can do. And, you know, you and I probably only use 10 of them, right? right. So, so people need to think about it in that context. Mm -hmm. um, during the webinar, there was, uh, during the question and answer period, there was, there seemed to be a lot of interest about strategic opportunities for growth. What do you think these might be for the, you know, the nonprofit uh, senior living communities that that you that your research focused on. Yeah, so we do a lot of strategic planning with our clients and um, opportunities for growth is definitely a part of their strategy. And that growth can come in a number of different ways. It can come in the form of, of development, you know, brand new greenfield construction or maybe a satellite campus. It can come in the form of asset um, repositioning. It can come in the form of acquisitions, mergers, affiliations, maybe a third party management contract. Um, where you, um, as the provider, goes in and, and manages for another organization. Maybe you do a triple net lease. Um, so you're operating and own the business, but someone else owns the um, real estate. Um, joint ventures. We've got a lot of clients that are focused on joint ventures and partnerships. And then lastly, I would say we've got a lot of clients that are looking to grow beyond bricks and mortar. So really focused mm. on home and community-based services, managed care, PACE programs, um, hospice. So all of those pieces can create growth. So when we work with our clients, we really try to help them define what areas of growth they want to focus on. Um, and, and then we will help them create criteria around that so that as opportunities come to them, they're able to vet that in a way that allows them to make um, dis good decisions, but also quick decisions. And, and that is part of the challenge for the not-for-profits. The for-profits have the money, they got to put it to work, and they're, they are quick to make decisions. Not-for-profits spend a lot of time, you know, um, thinking about those things. Mm. So if you've already established established with your board um, a criteria and a, and a way to effectively measure these opportunities, you can get them through and, and make good decisions a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. Dana and Alexis, thanks for joining us today, spending some time and talking a little bit about your research. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah. This is John Caulfield from Building Design and Construction. Thanks for joining us.